Quick Forest. Today I'm filming from our library, sitting in front of our beautiful wall of books. We are getting ready for a lecture that we hope you're going to enjoy. Today's speaker is nurse practitioner Kim Leobold. After graduating from the Riverside School of Professional Nursing, Kim earned a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Christopher Newport University and a Master of Science in Nursing from Virginia Commonwealth University. She is board certified as an adult nurse practitioner by the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners Certification Board. Kim has over 30 years of cardiology experience at Riverside with more than 20 years as a nurse practitioner. She has expertise in heart rhythm management and specializes in the care of patients who require pacemakers, defibrillators, ablations, and left atrial appendage closure implants. Kim works hard to provide education for her patients so that they can be key participants in the plan of care and understand it to their desired level. Born and raised in Smithfield, Kim is a country girl who loves this area, its seasons, beauty, history, and wonderful people. She and her family enjoy the great outdoors, the Outer Banks, and their dog. Kim enjoys running and mission work with her church and work family. We hope you enjoy today's lecture. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kim Lee Bold, and um, I'm not sure if you can see me or not. I know you can see my slides, hopefully, um, but I'm going to take my mask off, which is kind of unique for me these days. Um, but I uh, thank you for letting me come into your home and talk with you for the next hour. Um, the way we're set up today, I'll be sharing my screens um, and going through the conversation, the talk with you, and I won't be able to see the questions as we're going through. So I will try to leave some time at the end to answer those questions. So if you um, think of something, go ahead and send, submit the question while you're thinking about it, because I'll change topics. And if you're like me, you probably will forget. Um, but what I'm here to do today is I got to, a chance to talk to you all not too long ago. And we talked about um, devices. And those were like pacemakers and defibrillators. And so I very much enjoyed working with you. And so I um, asked that if they wouldn't be, wanted me to come back to talk about some more therapies and things that we do here at Riverside uh, in the EP or electrophysiology department, that I'd be glad to do that. So in the nature of uh, learning, I called that um, EP 101. So this is going to be EP 201, of course. Um, so I promise you, you all will pass this with flying colors today um, because there's no test. It's just kind of listening and see what we come up with. I always, when I have the opportunity to talk with you or anyone, I always try to get in my um, love for hands-only CPR and AED awareness. And particularly because this is um, Heart Month, so I want to end with that. You can never hear that too many times. So we will kind of talk about different things in EP and then end with our hands-only CPR. Um, again, I have no disclosures to report. Um, we will talk just briefly about what I had uh, mentioned last time in my 101 talk on the pacemakers. And then we're going to concentrate more on other therapies that we offer here at Riverside. Um, and with electrophysiology, it is the study of the rhythm or the electricity of the heart. So we will be talking about common arrhythmias that people can have and how we treat that, either medically uh, or ablations, and then different other opportunities we have with um, different procedures and things. And again, uh, um, the ending will be our hands-only CPR. So I am part of an electrophysiology team uh, here at Riverside. I'm a nurse practitioner, uh, and I work with two electrophysiologists, um, Dr. Jamshid Aladini and Dr. Scott Kaufman. And both of these perform all of the different uh, therapies that I'll be talking about today. And I work with them with the patients and helping uh, educate them and work with the therapies uh, as well. So um, what is exactly electrophysiology or the EP? Device implants. 
and ET, and that's what we call them for short, and you'll kind of see me refer to that, um, may implant and monitor devices that either help the patient's heart's electrical system uh, function properly, or they measure the heart rhythm. These devices include pacemakers, implantable cardiac defibrillators, or ICDs is the acronym, cardiac resynchronization therapy, which are devices we use in the heart failure um, population, and implanted heart rhythm uh, monitors called loop recorders. Um, often our patients refer to us as their heart electricians. So this is just a quick picture of our um, part of our electrophysiology team here at Riverside, and we're very excited to be able to work in some really amazing um, places. We have the hybrid OR, which is a very new high technical operating room that has all types of different um, uh, imaging abilities. We also have a brand new EP lab that we do all of our procedures in as well. And these are just some of the amazing people. It does uh, take a wonderful team um, to, to do the care. So the, the first thing I start off with is, is what is the difference between cardiac arrest versus a heart attack? And when people, particularly heart month, you hear so many different things about heart care, it's because there are a lot of different avenues to a patient. When somebody says they have heart disease, it's kind of hard to know exactly what you're referring to. So our talk and our concentration today will be more on the electrical activity of the heart. And so for us, um, when somebody says a cardiac arrest, that's an electrical problem. So that is what you're seeing on your screen, um, and it is to your left, and that is um, the rhythm of the heart or the electricity of the heart. Um, and if it is somebody who has had a heart attack, that's more the plumbing or the circulation where a clot can form and cause a death to the muscles. And then sometimes people very often can go into arrhythmias because the heart is um, deprived of oxygen, and you may have both events. It is not uncommon for that to occur. But today we'll focus on the electrical activity of the heart. So saying that, we're gonna um, just talk really quickly about what is normal electrical activity and what do we take for granted every day when we are walking around and don't feel our heart's beating and we check our heart rate and it's 60 when we're sitting still. Uh, and it's because our heart is an amazing muscle that has a conduction system that basically um, goes from up here to the top, which is the uh, natural pacemaker of the heart or the SA node, uh, sinoatrial node, and it sends electrical impulses simultaneously through these top chambers of the heart called the atrium down to the mid station, which is the AV nodal, um, uh, AV node, and that's AV for atrium, V for ventricle, and so it, it's right there at the junction of where one um, chamber meets the other, and that slows the conduction down and allows it to go simultaneously through the bottom chambers, and so you have one on the right side and one on the left that it simultaneously goes down, and those are called the bundle branch block, um, bundle branches, and then it goes into the little teeny, I'm trying to make my mouse work and it doesn't want to now, um, it goes into the little teeny fibers called the Purkinje fibers. So this is just a um, little short film about the normal electrical conduction system. And don't worry if it kind of sounds a little bit more than what you need to know, um, but it'll just kind of visualize it for you. Let's see if I can. Action potentials originate in the sinoatrial node and travel across the wall of the atrium from the sinoatrial node to the atrioventricular node. Action potentials pass slowly through the atrioventricular node to give the atria time to contract. They then pass rapidly along the atrioventricular bundle, which extends from the atrioventricular node through the fibrous skeleton into the interventricular septum. The atrioventricular bundle divides into right and left bundle branches, and action potentials descend rapidly to the apex of each ventricle along the bundle branches. Action potentials are carried by the Purkinje fibers from the bundle branches to the ventricular walls. The rapid conduction from the atrioventricular bundle to the ends of the Purkinje fibers allows the ventricular muscle cells to contract in unison, providing a strong contraction. Action potentials originate in the sinoatrium. Okay, you didn't need to see that twice. Um, so basically, the, the gist of that is to kind of just realize how amazing the heart muscle is in the electrical conduction system, because the heart is 
um, got a, a lot of different cells in it that has the ability to produce these impulses to create the electrical charge. Um, and so when we start talking about abnormalities, it makes a little bit more sense. This is the normal, this is the way it should go, but there's a lot of other sites and cells in the heart that can originate these electrical impulses and then kind of compete with the natural conduction system and want to take it over. And so our whole goal in electrophysiology is to restore, if possible, your natural electrical conduction system because you do better in that. Um, and if we can um, get rid of some of the competition, we do. If we can, then we work with that conduction system um, uh, that you have and make it be as um, normal as it can be for you and not have symptoms. So again, starting off um, with concentrating on the SA node, which is your natural pacemaker. Again, it's at the top chamber of your heart and it allows your heart to beat about 60 to 100 beats per minute. It then goes to that AV node, which is the um, mid station, which allows it to go from the top chamber to the bottom chamber, and it helps regulate the ventricle, which is the bottom, and that is where the um, muscle contracts and pushes the blood out with each heartbeat. And if you were to check your pulse, every time that um, bottom um, contracts and pushes the blood out would be equivalent to your pulse beat. So this, again, is just another look of it uh, to, to kind of just concentrate on that yellow system. That's the electrical conduction system. So this is an EKG, and you've probably seen these before when you've been um, visiting somebody or in the hospital and you see a monitor or if you see a piece of a, an electrocardiogram or EKG. And this is normal sinus rhythm, and this is what we all um, are primarily supposed to be in, and most of us are in most of the time. And I'm just going to try if I can make the mouse. I don't know if you can see this or not. But this small little hump here is the electrical activity as it travels through the top chamber of the heart, the atrium. Then as it passes and goes into the ventricle or the bottom chambers, that is what we see on the EKG. That's equivalent to the heart squeezing and pushing the blood flow out. Um, and then at the last peak is when the heart is at rest, getting ready to recharge and do it all over again. The key to this is looking and seeing. Every time you see one of these tall spikes, that would be equivalent to feeling a pulse. And you can see the regularity of this. And so that heartbeat is about 60 to 70 beats per minute. And that's a very normal sinus rhythm. So we'll kind of keep coming back to that so you can compare what is abnormal to what is normal. So I'm going to take this one slide and a few seconds here to go over what we talked about last time because I'll refer to it a little bit. Uh, we talked about Cardiac Devices 101 the last time we were together, and we um, talked about pacemakers, which you see over here to the left. And a pacemaker is a device we're able to implant in the chest when people have slow heart rates or maybe have a fainting or syncopal spell related to probably a pause or a heart um, conduction that does not work as it should. So this is for people who have slow heart rates and we don't want it to go slow. The second picture is a leadless pacemaker. It's called a micro, and we are doing this at Riverside. Um, it's really truly the size of a nickel. Um, it does not have all the leads uh, attached to it, and it's used in special situations where somebody might have an infection and we had to take their pacemaker out or have an anatomy that doesn't allow us to put the leads in. Um, and it goes just actually into the heart and sits into the heart chamber, um, and we're able to use that in certain circumstances. The third picture is AICDs, and this looks just like a pacemaker, but it's a little bigger, um, probably about the size of two silver dollars kind of put together, and it goes into the heart with a, a, um, a wire, but this, um, this lead or wire has the ability to monitor and to deliver a life-saving shock therapy if, someone's, if someone was to have a bottom chamber rhythm, such as ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, um, which would not sustain a heartbeat or a pulse, and a person would die of sudden death. If you get this, you've either survived one already on your own, and somebody who probably did hands-only CPR, which we'll talk about later, and helped you survive and got you to the hospital, or you were able to have someone um, um, detect and, and um, get to you right away, you would then get one in to reduce your chances of having that again, or if you have risk for um, an ability for rhythms that could cause sudden death, 
such as a weakened heart muscle or predisposition um, of a genetic, like a long QTC syndrome, uh, then we put those in preventatively. Um, so we have about, probably about 2,500 people in our practice that have different devices in that we care for. The last one over here is the subcutaneous AICD, and that's the same thing, it's just subcutaneous. It's under the skin and kind of external to the heart or outside the heart. And we again use this for maybe young people who don't want these wires in their heart for 50, 60 years um, or certain circumstances as well. There's criteria for that. The last little picture here on the bottom left is the loop recorder. And that is those little teeny implantable ones that go under the skin over top of the heart. And they're good for about three years. And they are allowing us to monitor for any rhythms that you may have. Um, and we put those in if someone's had a cryptogenic stroke, which is a stroke of unknown cause. And you'll find from the lecture here in just a little bit that often the cause is an arrhythmia called atrial fib. And we're trying to detect that to prevent a second stroke. Also, we put that in in people who have fainting spells and we can't figure out why. Those last for three years, and so we get a lot of data uh, and determine uh, rhythm um, assessment on those. So that's kind of a summary of what we did last time. So we're going to concentrate now for the next 45 minutes on common dysrhythmias, or some people call arrhythmias, and their treatment therapies. So we're going to concentrate on ones from the top chamber of the heart today, not so much the bottom chamber rhythms, uh, but the top chamber. And we call those SVTs, or supraventricular tachycardia. Um, and they kind of come in a group of different ones. And we're going to take those one by one. There's also some called PVCs, or ventricular tachycardia, or VT. Those are bottom chamber rhythms. And we'll touch on those for a little bit, but I'm not going to go in depth on those. Um, those are a little bit more complex and a little bit more individualized to each person. But the other top chamber rhythms are very common and a lot of people have them. So the treatment plan for arrhythmias, and what I'm going to show you for the, the next few slides is more of the procedure basis that we do. So I want to take this chance to kind of talk in general about rhythms and how we, how we uh, manage them we do have a systematic approach and each person is unique but we basically kind of do the same thing for most. Um, the um, plans again are uh, individual in the sense to you based on your symptoms, um, your other health issues, um, and, and just basically how um, they are affecting you. Um, some, some things we actually don't have to treat because it's pretty benign but if they make you uncomfortable or your quality of life is poor, then we treat the symptoms. The first thing in treating anything is we have to be able to identify. We don't know what we're treating unless we see it and can capture it. And that can be challenging. And a lot of you who are listening probably have dealt with this before. Um, if not yourself, and I mean no disrespect, but probably your car. You know, you get an issue, you hear something, something goes wrong, and you want to take it into the dealership and have them fix it. And, of course, it never happens when you take it in. Nothing's different with people. We come in and people have issues. We put monitors on them. And that never happens when we have the monitor. As soon as we take it off, they call us and say, this, this is what it is. So there's a lot of different ways we get around that. We do like to capture it on a 12-lead EKG if we have the opportunity. Um, so whether that is through the ER or EMS um, or here in the office setting. We can tell a lot by um, a rhythm captured on a 12 lead. We also have the technology now, and a lot of people ask how good are these, the Apple Watches and something called Cardio Mobile app, which is a small, and I have a picture in it in a, a future slide, but it's a small device that you can purchase for about $100, um, and it basically is just a, a, a little thing that looks like a, um, a rectangle, and you put your fingers on it, and it uh, links through an app wirelessly um, and through Bluetooth to any smartphone. I, uh, it can be a, um, uh, any, any brand. It doesn't have to be an iPhone. But um, the Apple Watch is an, uh, a product that can store the electrocardiograms as well as the rhythm, and you can upload it to the computer. And we actually work with some patients that do those things, and they come through my chart, and I'm able to, to view it and put it in their, their health records. Um, so those are ability for um, patients to kind of help take charge and look at their own rhythms sometimes. If we um, see rhythms, we always try with medical therapy at first, if, if possible. If they're fast rhythms, we try to do um, therapies to slow them down with different medicines. 
a lot of those medicines we would use are called beta blockers. Um, and that might be metoprolol or carvedilol or atenolol, you might have heard. Um, we also use um, calcium channel blockers, and those are usually diltiazem or verapamil. And those are medicines that just try to, we put them on as a maintenance, so that if you go into the fast rhythms, hopefully you won't go as fast. We always talk about lifestyle changes. These, no matter what we do, are essential um, to kind of helping you with any kind of rhythm issue. And that would be avoiding caffeine. Uh, other stimulants, um, particularly over-the-counter decongestants that have pseudoephedrine, that type of thing, they tend to rev things up and allow people to go into rhythms. And then if it's an urgent situation, if you're having a really fast heart rate and urgent, um, we want to break that heart rate pretty fast. And sometimes there's things called valsalva maneuvers that can be done um, depending on the rhythm. And you may have heard these before. Um, it's kind of basically where you um, um, bear down like you're having a bowel movement. You kind of hold your breath and strain, and that increases the intrathoracic pressure, the pressure around your heart, and sometimes can kind of uh, kind of make it that pressure kind of will, will shock the heart out of it. It'll just kind of make it stop doing it. Sometimes when people kind of um, um, almost kind of like drink something really cold that stimulates their fast heart rate, sometimes can drop it. Uh, we do a dive reflex sometimes where you put your face in an ice cold bath of water and that shock value kind of sometimes will do it. And the health system, um, and I don't encourage anyone to do this at home, but sometimes you'll see us kind of push on the carotid arteries and do a carotid massage and that triggers sometimes a, a nerve that conducts to the heart to slow the heart rate down. But again, would not do that um, unless that was the appropriate thing to do. There's always IV medicines in the emergency room, and we're not going to get into all those in our talk today, but there's the denison and IV diltiazem and beta blockers that they can use to try to bring the rate down. Um, and if that doesn't work and they're really concerned, then they will do what we call a direct um, current cardioversion, where we link you up to our um, defibrillators and we um, give you medicine to kind of help you relax. And then we uh, synchronize our heartbeat your heartbeat to our monitor and we deliver a shock and restart the the heart rate and get it to go back into regular rhythm i tell people it's like rebooting your computer um, so all of those are things that we do a lot of times for all of them um, but um, we also have therapies called catheter ablation that kind of help us for reoccurrences when those things continue to happen and we're going to concentrate a little bit more on those here in, the, in just a little bit so this is just a quick picture of those um, heart monitors. The one to your left is your Apple Watch. And just be aware that the more expensive Apple Watch is the one that has the rhythm strips. The other ones probably just talk more about your rate uh, and have um, graphs and stuff. The thing to the right is the Cardio Mobile. And again, we'll work with any smartphone, Android, or iPhone. So we're going to talk a little bit about catheter ablations. This is just a fancy picture of all the uh, computer um, screens that we have in our EP lab. It is extremely technical. It is way more than I'm able to even um, be able to describe, but I'm going to kind of give you the, the best um, I can for just the, the simplest, but I'm probably simplifying it way more uh, than I'm giving the uh, electrophysiologist credit. So when we work with um, catheters, we are entering the venous system mainly, which is the vein usually in the femoral art, uh, in the femoral area or the groin area where we go up through the veins to the right side of the heart and then we pass over uh, into the left side of the heart as well. So there's lots of catheters and the most is probably about bottom chamber of the right, and then over in the coronary sinus, which um, puts us over to the left side. And then um, depending on other ways of monitoring, they may even have one in the neck that comes down. So the first one that we're going to talk about uh, is a supraventricular tachycardia arrhythmia called AV nodal reentry tachycardia, or AVNRT. Fancy word, but if you break it down and look at it, it's talking about that um, mid-station, that AV node, where it re-enters and creates a fast heart rate. And people are born with this sometimes, um, and it starts reoccurrence. We see this a lot of times in younger people, and this is very um, uh, a good fix with our ablations. So we're going to start off, again, it's most common, 40 to 50 percent of people who have the fast heart rates uh, in this um, way are from this. 
It results from an abnormal electrical properties between two pathways of the AV node. About 60% of people have dual AV nodes, and this is the pathophysiology that allows that to happen. And 20 to 30 percent of the people that have the right properties between these pathways can can allow this to happen. Um, and so fixing it is um, keeps it from reoccurring. So I'm just going to kind of show you real quick. Uh, there are two pathways. Um, one is fast and one is slow. And this is kind of interesting. The fast pathway conducts uh, electricity really uh, fast, but it recovers slow. So it's faster at the mark, but it takes a while to get it back and uh, ready to start again. The other pathway, the slow one, is the opposite. It's slow to conduct electricity, but it recovers really fast and is ready to, to, to go again for another uh, impulse. So when the refractory period, which is the rest period, when something is kind of refractory, you know, basically means it needs to kind of rest and get ready to, to um, work again. And these um, pathways over time may just come in the right perfect storm so that this reentry happens. And so I'm going to show you this really quick. Um, this is uh, the fast pathway conducts first, then the slow pathway conduction is blocked, and the normal conduction goes through the common or the end of the Y there, and that's the way normal conduction should be. So there's your fast pathway on your right, your slow pathway on your left, and the common pathways at the bottom, and this is going to be how the conduction should occur. It comes from the fast, the red is what should happen, comes down here, this is blocked because it's already busy over here, and that's a normal conduction through the pathway. But what happens abnormally is that a premature beat comes and kind of gets everything a little off sequence, so the heart is kind of trying to, to look at that extra beat, that early beat, so it's kind of uh, allowing some things to happen that shouldn't happen. So the fast pathway is still kind of in refractory from that previous beat. It's still kind of recovering from that previous beat, and it's not ready to take the impulse. But remember that slow pathway, it can recover a lot quicker, so it's going to conduct it, and not only does it conduct it down like it's supposed to, antegrade from top to bottom, but it can go retrograde and come back around and develop this circuit. And we're going to kind of see that here. So you can see how it comes down now over here, and it goes down like it's supposed to, but it also goes back and loops back over, and guess what that does? It kind of stimulates this reentry circuit that happens, and resulting in uh, AVNRT. So it's going to show you, the, watch these little lightning bolts. I have to give all the credit to this to Dr. Aladini. He is the one who did all these really cool slides. Um, so that's what happens. So people get in that really, really loop, and it's a fast heart rate of about 180 beats per minute, um, and it happens like a light switch comes on, and it's hard to break with medicines, but ablation can take care of this. Um, so that's what an EKG looks like. See how fast that looks? And we're going to compare that to a normal one just to give you an idea um, that that's, you know, that's a really fast rate, and people don't tolerate that sometimes. So how do we treat it? We go in and we ablate. Um, and so we ablate that slow pathway so then the conduction can only go through the fast pathway in the right system. So again, fast pathway, slow pathway, common, and we're going to ablate right there where we do not want it to go through. And ablation is a radio frequency heat catheter um, that goes in um, there and just finds that spot and just kind of basically burns it. I tell people it's kind of like that old wood burning set we used to play with it kids, or my generation did, um, and you just cause scar tissue, and scar tissue becomes dead tissue, and dead tissue does not conduct electricity, so then that blocks it. It's like a roadblock. So now when it goes to conduct, it cannot do it and only can go through the normal pathway, and it's a treatment that doesn't require medications, and it usually has a really good outcome and lasts um, lifetime. So you can see how that kind of procedure would make a big difference. I'm going to move through this one a little bit quicker. Um, and there's a lot of clicks in, and I know it's a little complex, but just hang on with me for a little bit. These are accessory pathways, and these are connections between the top and bottom chambers of the heart that aren't supposed to be there, and so you're born this way. And um, they can be uh, located virtually anywhere around the valves of the heart. Um, the tricuspid valve is on the right side of the, the heart, and the uh, mitral valve is on the left side, and they are the um, valves that separate the top and bottom chambers. And so anywhere along that, these, these pathways can kind of occur, and they're very fast to conduct. I think of them as like an expressway or a loop, uh, like around the expressway in D.C., where the traffic just swirls and goes fast. Uh, this is the same thing. It's going to make its own 
um, conduction pathway. Uh, and there's no um, speed bumps, basically. There's no, there's no mechanism to slow it down any. So it usually conducts backwards as well. So this is just going to show you this really quickly again. This is your normal AV node where we normally see the conduction go through. And this over here to the right would be an accessory pathway, it would be something that's not supposed to be there. And then what we see is the normal conduction goes through, but now that pathway up in the right hand side allows it to go through even more. And so I'm going to show you with those little air or those little lightning bolts. Watch those little lightning bolts. And see that left one? It kind of allows it to go up and around. And so it retrograde conducts and it goes backwards. And it sets it up for this circuit that just can go around and around. And so it starts all over again. And see how it loops? And that can go really fast in the electrical um, conduction and um, make people have really fast heart rates. And people don't do well with that at all. Um, again, uh, another one is called WPW, and that's Wolf Parkinson's White, um, and that's the name of the doctor, pretty sure, that um, diagnosed this or, or named it. And it's a syndrome that's caused by an accessory pathway that conducts forward, so it goes fast in the, in the forward, and this one is very dangerous and can cause sudden death because it just goes so fast that the heart can't keep up with it. And so again, this is going in the other way and just loops really fast. Again, conduction um, can be um, altered with um, doing the ablation and getting rid of that. I'm going to go through this really quick. This is just an EKG criteria because we do this for um, healthcare people and it helps them to decide. But this shows you what an EKG complex looks like differently in this particular arrhythmia. It's called WPW. And this is not something that you have to really kind of worry about. But that's an EKG, though it's not as fast as some of them can do. So we're going to move on to how to treat that. So um, basically, we just go in and ablate that conduction, that pathway. So you can see right here, we just kind of went in with our catheter, used radio frequency heat, identified it with a mapping system, knew exactly where it was, got rid of it. And now when it wants to do that, uh, it can't do it anymore. So that, again, is treated much better by ablation procedures than medications. So then it will go through its normal conduction and not loop back around. So the next one we're going to go is atrial tachycardia, and that's basically a fast heart rate from multiple sites in the top chamber of the heart. And because all cells can, of the heart can produce electrical impulses, these are just irritable cells that start to fire a lot. And so uh, it can come from either side of the uh, top chamber of the heart and just start firing, and it just makes it faster. And again, uh, we can use medications. Um, to help suppress this, um, but there is some ablation procedures that we can do. Again, that's what the EKG looks like um, compared to a regular one. And how do we treat that if we're going to do an ablation with it? Um, we find the spot um, through um, 3D mapping, which I'm going to show you that in a minute, which is just kind of like our GPS of the electrical conduction system. Some of those catheters we put in help us identify exactly the location of where stuff is, and we know exactly where we want to go and ablate. So we go in and ablate it, and then it doesn't happen anymore, and then normal electrical conduction system can take over. This is just a quick slide on those bottom chamber rhythms. I'm going to go through this really quick because this is a lot more than what we want to talk about, and I want to get to the atrial fib, which is most important for you. Um, these are just sites. This is like a picture of a heart, and these are sites where the conduction of these extra beats can come from, and it's amazing. My electrophysiologist can get an EKG and can pretty much look at an, a PVC on it and can tell me where it's originating from in the heart and where they're going to go after it. Um, so it's, it's pretty amazing. And these are all the different kind of images they use in the cath lab to map it out and to know where to ablate those little spots or kind of those red spots or, or where they ablate. And, and um, it's pretty amazing. So we're going to concentrate now on uh, atrial flutter. Um, and this is a, a reentry circuit um, that's caused by rapid um, 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 firing of the um, chamber of the heart. And um, the right side is where it is most specific. And I'm just going to show you this. So it kind of gets into this, uh, again, circuit um, pattern where it goes around uh, counterclockwise. Um, and it doesn't allow the electricity to go down as it should. It just loops and goes really fast. Um, and so it has an EKG that um, sometimes can be controlled. This one is fairly good rate control. 
is probably on some medicines, and I'll bring up the normal rhythm to compare. But you'll see this little sawtooth-looking pattern. Each one of these little beats here that looks like a sawtooth, I can't make my mouse work, um, is when um, the top chamber of the heart condu conducts electricity to the bottom. And so you can see it's very fast in the top chamber. And so we're able to ablate that as well. And that is ablated. Um, and this is just kind of a picture showing you as it goes around the heart. Um, this is um, how it's ablated. If you look down at the bottom, there's this brown line that's coming up. This is where they take the catheter and they ablate that area because that is the origin where that starts to loop. And if they get rid of that, then it'll go through the normal conduction system and, and pretty much is very successful on right-sided typical A flutter with an ablation um, to treat that and people don't have reoccurrence of that. That's probably one of the most common rhythms we ablate. Atrial fibrillation is by far the most talked about rhythm, and it is um, the most prevalent um, that people have. Um, one in five people, or 20%, have atrial fib, and it's bec important because of some long-term health issues that can occur from it, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But what it is, is it's a rapid erratic firing of a lot of different cells or a group of cells in the top chamber of the heart. And it's just really unorganized and can be quite fast for people. And it can cause the top chamber of the heart to quiver. I say it's kind of like a bag of worms where the top chamber quivers and the bottom is going, what are you doing? And it's trying to respond to everything. And you get a very irregular heart rhythm that often can be quite fast. And so you can see that little activity up in the top chamber. So this is an EKG of atrial fib. You look up at the top, it has a lot of kind of like squiggly baseline. That's because that top chamber, that atrium is just quivering and the bottom chamber is trying to respond to it and, and just can't keep up and you don't want it to because it would go way too fast. So we're comparing the top chamber to the bottom. This is normal rhythm. And I believe next will be a quick little video and it doesn't have any sound, so it's not your computer, but just watch how the heart responds differently. And you can see how people could have symptoms of palpitations or shortness of breath. Um, when the heart does this. So you're kind of looking at a normal conduction and you can see how the heart squeezes and just think of it as being symmetrical. It kind of works very nicely. In atrial fibrillation, what you're seeing is that there is an irregularity and so the, they're just not synchronous. It's like a dance couple that's not um, in step together. 2.3 million people in the, UNES, in the United States have AFib. 160,000 new cases are diagnosed every year. And again, um, nine out of 100 people easily will have AFib after the age of 65. You know someone or yourself um, has AFib. It's very uncommon to, to not know somebody. Symptoms can be anything from fatigue and decreased exercise capacity to faster heartbeats and palpitations and shortness of breath. Some people can have chest pain, pressure, or tightness. Some people are going to have dizziness, lightheadedness, or a fainting type feeling. Um, other people have none, and I think that's the hardest piece, is we don't want people to have symptoms, but they don't even know about it, and so they don't know it until they come in for an exam, and their doctor hears an irregularity, or they get an EKG for a surgery, and AFib is, is seen, or unfortunately, the cryptogenic stroke, and that is the stroke of the unknown etiology or unknown cause, and we end up, end up putting one of those loop recorders in, like I referred to earlier, and we find out people had AFib. And so our goal then is to identify it and get them on the appropriate blood thinner to reduce a stroke. Complications of AFib. It's important to know that AFib is not life-threatening. This is not a rhythm that causes sudden death. Um, it is one that has serious complications that can occur if it's not treated and followed. And those could be anywhere from a major life-threatening stroke or debilitating stroke to heart failure. And so the key is getting them on a blood thinner to prevent clots from forming in a stroke and then to treat or control the AFib based on what that person's life is. So that's kind of our treatment goals for AFib. And AFib is, is diagnosed in classifications. It's paroxysmal, persistent, or longstanding persistent. We used to call that chronic or permanent. And the definition of them is paroxysmal is short. It comes and goes on its own. It's unpredictable, and it lasts minutes, hours, or less than seven days. If it is persistent atrial fib, it's longer than a week, so it's greater than seven days, and it keeps going unless we do something to stop it, whether it's medication or a procedure. If it's persistent longstanding, it continues for over a year, and it's usually lifetime, and we do, uh, it does not go away when we treat it. We may try different medicines. We may try 
uh, cardio versions or shocking it in the past and it just doesn't respond. And then you and your healthcare person determine this is what you're going to live with um, and make your quality of life uh, um, the best it can be. And millions of people are out there live with AFib every day. And most of them don't even know about it. Others, we have the symptoms and rates controlled and their stroke risk reduced. And it is absolutely fine. So please don't take this as um, you know, a decrease in quality of life because it's not. Um, treatment options, again, rate control with medicines, ablation therapy, uh, rhythm control where we try to get it back into rhythms. And again, with ablations and um, different therapies. And key to all of it is anticoagulation with blood thinners such as Coumadin or some of the new agents. Um, and then we also have a, a procedure we call a watchman or left atrial appendage closure device that we're able to use uh, also for the people who can't be on blood thinners long term. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, medications, again, same as we talked about, uh, rate controlling medicines, the beta blockers and diltiazem we talked about earlier, and blood thinners. Um, again, the treatment is to control the rate with these medicines at various um, places in the heart that we work on and find that control um, with each individual person based on how they respond to medicines. Um, we do something sometimes called a pace and ablate therapy, and this is when uh, we nothing else has worked. It's usually a kind of our last um, effort to get their controlled rate. We put a pacemaker in and then we ablate the node, which means we go in with a catheter and we basically sever the communication from the top and bottom. So the top chambers of the heart will stay in AFib, but the bottom chamber is now going to listen to the pacemaker and not listen to the top chamber and be on a regular control basis. They still have to be on the blood thinner, but they're not on medicines to control heart rate and they feel much better um, with them. Um, when we first get it diagnosed, we put people on blood thinners, um, and then usually we will do that cardioversion and try to get you back in regular rhythm, and that's where I talked about shocking the heart and kind of rebooting the computer, and that's what this is a picture of. Um, we will do the catheter ablations, um, and uh, this is where we do uh, isolate the pulmonary veins, which are the veins here that allow blood flow that is oxygenated from the lungs back into the heart on the left atrium. And this is where most uh, AFib sites come from. So it's very challenging and they have to be very specific how they do that. Um, but they are able to go in there and map it and um, put um, ablation catheters in and get rid of those sites. This is gonna be a video really quickly about ablation that I think will explain a lot and we'll move on from this topic. During a catheter ablation procedure, a thin, flexible tube, or catheter, is placed through a small incision in the leg, where it's then advanced up through a vein and into the heart. There are two phases during a radiofrequency ablation, mapping and ablation. During mapping, an electrophysiologist creates a three-dimensional image of the heart using specialized catheters in order to identify the area of abnormal electrical signals, which may be causing the arrhythmia. In the second phase, ablation, the electrophysiologist directs a catheter to the targeted areas and delivers radio frequency energy in order to create a small scar within the heart muscle. This will then block the faulty electrical impulses and restore normal electrical pathways in the heart. So that's what I've kind of been describing. It's, uh, it's um, pretty amazing. This is another um, video real quick. Contact force therapy is a minimally invasive procedure that involves the insertion of a catheter through a small incision in the groin where it is then weaved up to the heart through a blood vessel in the leg. Once the catheter reaches the upper left chamber of the heart, an advanced 3D map guides the controlled application of contact force therapy around the openings of the pulmonary veins. This advanced technology enables doctors, for the first time, to precisely and accurately control how much pressure they're applying against the heart wall to ensure optimal outcomes. The lesions that are created work to isolate and prevent the abnormal electrical signals originating from those pulmonary veins from reaching the rest of the heart. The catheter is then removed and a small bandage is applied to the area where it was inserted. Patients are typically out of the hospital in one or two days and can resume normal activities.
So um, that kind of just shows you kind of quickly about the uh, catheters that we use and the technology now, what that last catheter was shown is just one of the catheters we use. Um, and it, it has that ability for the, um, to know how much pressure. So when a doctor is, um, an electrophysiologist is applying pressure to do the ablation or to do the radio frequency heat, it allows them to know just how much pressure to, to place to, to do it safely but effectively. The technology has become amazing to, to be successful with these programs. So the biggest piece um, that I want to kind of also share about this is the stroke risk. And I think it would be a disservice to kind of talk about um, atrial fibrillation without talking about stroke for a second, because the people are five times uh, higher likely to have a stroke when they have a fib. And um, this is just a quick little video In AF, about the heart um, works stroke. less effectively as a pump with the result that there are areas within the heart I love where British blood flow accent. is slow or stagnant. Where this happens, blood clots can form, and these account for the increased risk of stroke associated with AF. The problem with a blood clot in the heart is that some or all of it can break away and travel along an arterial highway directly into the brain. As the blood vessels branch and become ever finer, at some stage the clot or fragment of clot is going to be too large to progress any further and will block the vessel in which it is travelling. This means that the surrounding area of the brain can no longer receive oxygen delivered by the blood, causing the nerve cells to stop working and ultimately die. This complication is called a stroke, or more precisely, an ischemic stroke. Because clots that form in the heart may be quite big, they can block wide vessels that supply large areas of the brain. Consequently, strokes arising from AF may often be fatal or can cause temporary or permanent disabilities, depending on how long the oxygen supply to the brain is interrupted and which part of the brain was affected. That's a, a pretty overwhelming uh, kind of video, but I absolutely love to hear her voice, even though that's a pretty um, uh, serious looking video. Um, so basically, as she said, AFib um, related strokes are quite debilitating um, in um, all kinds of ways. Uh, again, um, visually not able to speak, paralysis on one side, um, uh, creating a lot of disability. So we do a scoring system, and, I, and for sake of time, because we have about 10, 15 minutes, and I want to um, make sure I leave some time at the end for um, questions. We have a, a scoring system. We call it the Chad's Bass scoring system, and it's your score based on your risk for stroke, and it goes through different uh, health issues a person would have, whether they have congestive heart failure or age, hypertension, previous stroke, um, a, a variety of things, and we score them. And anything two or greater usually requires recommendations for a blood thinner because the risk more than average for a stroke um, supports that. We also look at the bleeding risk for people because obviously it's not something that um, goes without its own risk. People fall and hit their heads or have GI bleeds and are e equally life-threatening. So we have a scoring system for bleeding as well. And we try to find that in-between uh, area. But what we find a lot with um, atrial fib is that this is an echo of the heart and this little thing down here is a clot sitting in the heart and we tend to find these a lot in AFib and it goes into something called the left atrial appendage which is like a little windsock that comes off the top left chamber of the heart and these clots can just sit in it and then eventually push out into the body and cause the stroke. So about 90% of clots from atrial fib um, come from that source in the heart. And so when you want to be on a blood thinner and anticoagulant, um, there are several choices. There is Coumadin and Warfarin, which has been around for years. Um, there is the new ones, the DOAX, which is Eliquis, Pradaxa, Zeralto, and Silvesa. And then there's a procedure called a left atrial appendage closure device. Um, when we talk about anticoagulation with Coumadin, it is, ha everyone has its risk and its benefits. And you talk to your provider individually about what works for you. Um, just very quickly, um, Coumadin has been around for a long time. It is um, something that is not affected by um, um, your kidneys, so people who have kidney issues can be on it. 
It is, uh, it does get affected by your diet, particularly um, dark green leafy vegetables. It does require uh, monitoring and, and um, can have a lot of variability with it and it's hard to keep it in a uh, range that it needs to be to reduce your stroke. Um, but it has been around and is still available. And we have Coumadin clinics that have over um, several thousand patients in it. And it is still what people use when they have artificial valves. Um, they require um, Coumadin. Again, trying to keep them in that range is uh, important. And usually the range is two to three for the loud value. Um, there is other ones called Pradaxa, Xeralto, and Eliquis. Those are the newer agents. They are more priced. They cost more, um, but they don't interfere with diet. They don't require monitoring, um, and they are primarily excreted by the kidneys that we can use Eliquis now um, for um, kidney issue patients and even dialysis patients. So we have that opportunity, and a lot of people choose to go this route, and we do very well with it. Um, but it does have, you know, issues because it, you know, you do have an increased risk for bleeding. And so that has to be looked at. For those people who are not good candidates for long-term blood thinner, um, for whatever reason, uh, whether they can't get to appointments, they can't uh, stay in range, they um, have um, cost issues that we try all kinds of ways and just can't. Uh, and usually we're pretty good about doing that. So that's not usually a, um, a factor as much. Um, but maybe um, GI bleeds uh, on an agent, um, then there is an alternative that we can offer for some people that have atrial fibrillation that's not coming from a valve issue, and it's called a left atrial appendage closure device or a watchman procedure. And this is just a um, small um, device that we implant into that left atrium, um, almost kind of like I say, it's kind of like a Tupperware uh, lid on a container where you basically make sure there's no clot in there and then we seal that up with a watchman and then the body adheres uh, to it and seals it with um, endothelialization or lining um, that grows over top of it. And then they can be off of the main blood thinner. They would stay on an aspirin and Plavix or Clopidogrel for six months. Uh, after that sealed, which it takes about six weeks to seal, and then ultimately um, that closed device and the aspirin protects them from a stroke if it is coming from AFib for, is, uh, for life. Um, it does not prevent strokes uh, or blood clots occurring in other places in the body. This is purely for AFib in the heart. So if someone has a DVT in their leg or embolus uh, in the uh, lungs, it does not protect from that, and they would have to be on blood thinners. Um, pills for those. So this is our team that puts in the Watchman uh, in our hybrid OR. Um, and I'm going to just kind of go through this kind of quickly here again. Um, these are the criteria for it. If you have fall risk, or poor compliance, or can't get stay in that therapeutic range with your Coumadin, or you have an occupational lifestyle that increases bleeding, like I have people who work in construction on scaffolding. Um, if you have severe renal failure, like dialysis patients, we do this quite a bit. Um, and other situations, we take it very individually. Um, lots of research and data have gone through this. Um, it was FDA approved in 2015. We started here at Riverside in May of 2019, uh, and we've just launched our newest up, um, second generation Watchman Flex that is allowing us to be able to uh, put it in more people because the design is um, uh, more user friendly, basically. And this is kind of what it looks like. This is the older one. This is what we have now. So you can see it's a little bit more of a ball type. And that allows us to be able to put it in smaller appendages. And I'm going to go through it kind of quick here. It has really good um, success rates and um, um, very low uh, risk rates. Um, these are the different sizes. And we do it based off the measurements of your appendage. And this is a video. I'm going to let you watch it for a second. It'll be all we talk about. Interesting Watchman Flex, built on the most studied and most implanted LAAC device in the world. Watchman Flex is designed to advance procedural performance and safety while expanding the treatable patient population. Watchman Flex has full recapture, reposition, and redeploy capabilities for precise placement. It is designed to have a quicker complete seal for the best long-term outcomes and to treat the widest range of patient anatomies. Watchman Flex is available in five device sizes with an allowable compression range of 10 to 30%.
Watchman Flex pushes forward as the leader in LAAC therapy. To perform the implant, the physician accesses the patient's femoral vein and, using a standard transeptal access system with a puncture needle, crosses the septum to reach the left side of the heart. Watchman Flex is designed for precise placement in the left atrial appendage, from windsock to broccoli to chicken wing. Measurements are taken of the appendage with TEE. Contrast may be injected at any time to help visualize the left atrial appendage. At this point, the appropriate size Watchman Flex is selected. The Watchman Flex ball is formed. The fully rounded ball is designed to safely advance and maneuver within the left atrial appendage. Watchman Flex has full recapture, reposition, and redeploy capabilities for precise placement. Before final release of the device, the physician checks the pass criteria. Position. The device is flush against the osteal plane. Anchor. The fixation anchors are engaged and the device is stable as proven by a tug test. Size. The device is compressed to 10 to 30 percent of its original size. And seal. Using color Doppler imaging, the physician checks for residual flow around the device. Dual row precision anchors designed to provide optimal device engagement with LAA tissue for long-term stability. Reduced metal exposure and long PET fabric designed to reduce healing time and reduce thrombus formation. Once in place, the device endothelializes to seal off the patient's left atrial appendage. Post-procedure, the patient takes an oral anticoagulant and aspirin for at least 45 days until a complete seal is confirmed by TEE. After discontinuing the oral anticoagulant, the patient takes clopidogrel and aspirin followed by ongoing aspirin therapy. Built on the most studied and most implanted LAAC device in the world, Watchman Flex is designed to advance procedural performance and safety while expanding the treatable patient population. Pushing forward as the leader in LAAC therapy, Watchman Flex. So this is just kind of a, a picture as we um, kind of like a, the x-ray, the imaging that we use, and it shows how we're inside the appendage and we can um, kind of put it in and then um, launch it, we deploy it. So that just kind of shows you how it kind of fits in. I know this is a little bit more graphic than probably what you wanted, and you may not want broccoli or chicken wings for a while, but um, that's how we describe the visual of it. Um, it gets quite creative sometimes, uh, how people's anatomy is different. And so the PEE that they were referring to is a transesophageal echo, and that's a special echo, kind of almost like an endoscopy where you swallow a probe, and it has a camera where we're looking at the heart and, and taking pictures and measurements. So again, this is the medication uh, afterwards, and this is what it kind of looks like when it seals over. Uh, it is an overnight um, procedure. You come in the hospital one day. There is no cutting or opening. It is all punctured through a catheter, um, and it usually takes about an hour. We usually allot for about two and a half hours um, for them, and again, the success rate, we're um, able to take people off their blood thinners usually at that um, six-week EEE. Uh, we've not had anybody we've not been able to. Um, and um, and it is uh, it is a, a good procedure for the right person. It is not the answer for everyone, and it is not the standard of care. Uh, the anticoagulant blood thinners are so that is where you always start. And some people have that as an option. These are really good resources that are great sites for anyone who wants to look up further information uh, on any of the stuff we talked about. Uh, and I am taking um, five minutes of my question time to just um, remind you of a life-saving 
um, two steps um, that may save um, your loved one's life, and it's hands-only CPR. And what the concept is, is if you recall um, from anything you've heard before, if you see someone uh, go down that suddenly collapses, usually a teenager or an adult, you want to take action. You want to be that very first responder. So you want to call 911 and get the responders to you, but you want to be that first person to do something to help. So um, calling 911, getting them on the phone, putting it on speakerphone so that you can um, go ahead and start performing chest compressions and that uh, uh, emergency operator will kind of help you and direct you and you're not alone, um, but it can save a life. So it's two steps to save a life. Call um, 911 right away and start pushing hard and fast in the center of the chest. And um, AED awareness is another passion of mine. Um, you can get um, um, certified in it by going to the American Heart Association and doing um, your CPR and community and friends and it talks about AEDs, but you don't have to be certified. Just knowing about it and being aware of it. It was designed to be for public use. These were not put on the walls in the mall or in the airports uh, or in your large uh, in, um, gymnasiums or corporations um, for the, the 911 people to take off the walls. They were designed for the lay person to be able to identify um, who needs it, to put it on, and to cut it on and then do what it says. It truly is designed to walk you through it. Um, so I encourage you to, to in, take a little bit of your own time during this COVID shutdown time still to, to learn that because we know that over 350,000 people die of cardiac arrest outside of the hospital and 90% of them um, don't make it. Um, CPR can double or triple survival rates and 70% of cardiac arrest happen in the home. So unless you've got an EMS person in your home, you would be the very first responder. And so knowing what to do and how to do makes a huge difference in our world. Um, and again, uh, 46 people who suffer out of hospital arrest um, need help before EMS arrives. Um, this is a, a slide showing 20 people. One person will survive a cardiac arrest outside of a hospital, and that one person is somebody who knows that has somebody around them that knows CPR, even hands only, um, and has an AED um, for quick survival. Um, so it truly does make a difference. And so I'm just gonna kind of go through these just really quickly to get to our end point and answer questions. But this is just a quick slide, just showing a heart monitor when somebody goes through a cardiac arrest and how quickly those minutes make a difference for us. Um, and there is a quick little um, slide here I just wanna show. Um, and I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly. Uh, there's different laws that protect even um, your, your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, nephews. They're learning how to do this in ninth grade as part of the SOL in public schools um, because uh, a child died, um, her name was Gwyneth. She died on the playground while everybody watched her and didn't know what to do and they called 911 and by the time they got there, she was already gone um, and so her parents um, went and made um, this a state law. Um, also with the Good Samaritan law that basically tells you if you try your best, if you're not out there trying to perform open heart surgery, that's not gonna cover you. But if you're out there trying your best to do CPR to the best of your ability and help somebody, they're not gonna, they're not gonna sue you. That's a Good Samaritan law. Um, so we're going to just move along a little bit here. There is always the traditional CPR, and I always do encourage it. When you do chest compressions, we talk about pushing hard and fast in the center of the chest. It's at least 100 beats per minute, um, and that's to uh, the Staying Alive song on tempo and other songs, and you want to push about two inches of depth. And so this kind of just shows you uh, that, and as you push, just visualize you're squeezing the blood out of the heart, and it's going up to the brain and keeping the person alive. Um, during that time. And there is one quick video uh, I'm going to show you. If you see a teen or adult suddenly collapse, it's important to act fast. Helping to save a life is easier than you might think. Just start hands-only CPR. The first step is to send someone to call 911 or call 911 yourself. Then get directly over the victim. Put the heel of one hand in the center of the chest, then put your other hand on top of the first. 
Then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until help arrives. It's important to push, giving 100 to 120 compressions per minute, which is about the same tempo as the song Stayin' Alive. Let's hope you never have to use hands-only CPR. But if you see a teen or adult suddenly collapse, don't be afraid to try it. Remember, call 911, then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until help arrives. Your actions can help save a life. So um, we have about three questions, and I have about um, probably about seven minutes. So I am going to show this video because, again, I think this is um, a part of a fear factor that people don't know what's in those red boxes that are up there. They're a little scary looking. And this is just the video that kind of tells you. And I want you to realize, again, it tells you everything you need to do. So I encourage you to um, familiarize yourself with where they are. If you go to the Y, if you are... Um, you know, go to your kids' schools to know where they are. So if you don't even use it, you know where to run and get it. You know who has them. Um, but I also encourage you to, to maybe take a class and, and learn it a little bit more. But I will promise you, if I'm down and you see me and you've never even had a class, I don't care. Just go get it off the wall and you can use it on, on me because it will save a life. Now that you are familiar with the defibrillator, we will begin the demonstration. Pull on them to activate the defibrillator. Lift the protective cover up and away. By doing this, the device will guide you through the rescue process. Begin by removing all clothing from the patient's chest. Cut clothing if needed. When patient's chest is bare, remove protective cover and take out white adhesive pads. Look carefully at the pictures on the white adhesive pads. Peel one pad from the yellow plastic liner. Place pad exactly as shown in the picture. Press firmly to patient's bare skin. When the first pad, look carefully at the picture on the second pad. Peel the second pad from the yellow plastic liner. Place pad exactly as shown in the picture. Press firmly to patient's bare skin. No one should touch the patient. Analyzing. No one should touch the patient. Analyzing. Shock advised. Stay clear of patient. Press the flashing orange button now. Deliver shock now shock delivered be sure emergency medical services have been called it is safe to touch the patient begin cpr for help with cpr press the flashing blue button play of one in the center of the chest between the nipples place your other hand on top of the first push the chest down firmly two inches. Keep time with the beat. So I'm going to stop it there. Um, let me go through this slide really quick to our question slide. Um, and so again, during this time, you can do a lot of American Heart Association online courses. Um, and again, I would just encourage you to familiarize yourself with those things um, it's, those are life lessons that are um, invaluable. So I'm going to ask them now to kind of help me see what kind of questions we have, and we just have a, about six minutes, I think. So our first question, and I'm going to kind of watch the time here. Can any of the electrical problems be diagnosed before potential catastrophic symptoms? Absolutely. Um, it can be. Um, some people, unfortunately, like I said, are not symptomatic and don't know it um, and find it incidentally. But if you have symptoms, you just need to be aware of your body and know, you know, things aren't right and you know yourself better than anyone else. And I do find nowadays with our technology and people's technical skills, they're coming in and showing me all kinds of stuff on their Apple watches and, and um, their um, cardio mobile. So um, those things kind of help, but just be persistent. Sometimes it does take a while to capture it, but there's all kinds of monitors that we can put on for 24 hours, 22 hours. Um, um, 72 hours, 
and for 30 days. So there's lots of, of opportunity for us to kind of get that rhythm and see what's going on before something happens. Um, so then uh, the next question was, uh, enzymes associated with electrophysiology, if so, how are they identified? Um, and, and I'm assuming from this um, question, we're talking about enzymes. Um, what I think of when you're referring to that is like the enzymes we test when you come into the um, to the um, ER if you're having chest pains and if it's a heart attack, there are blood tests for that. If we're talking about genetic and different things, um, there are genetic tests. We do a lot of stuff based off of history. If there's family history of arrhythmia, some things do have genetic um, testing and, and things available for that um, that um, can make a difference for treatment of different types of uh, electrolytes and things that we find in labs. Having a very nice defined potassium and magnesium levels are all important um, because electrolytes, when they get out of um, value, can increase your arrhythmia risk. And then um, does exercise reduce the risk of stroke? It doesn't reduce the risk of stroke so much in the sense of um, protecting you if you have um, a risk like atrial fibrillation. It doesn't keep you from having that risk, um, but it certainly helps you in your overall well-being and health. Um, and you just, if you have a fib or if you have an irregular rhythm and you're doing exercise, you want to kind of work with your doctor first to make sure it's okay. And then I use what I call perceived exertion is, you know, as you're exercising, you just ease into it. You don't do too many things at one time that's new. Um, and you just kind of make sure that you can talk through it and that you're not um, having lots of palpitations or a fast um, heart rate that's too aggressive. And then you have good warm up and cool down time. And then some people will have, um, you know, that information to share with their providers. And that helps us know if we need to adjust your medicines more because your heart rate, if you're in AFib, may be controlled at, at rest, but not with activity, and we would work more um, with you on that. Um, let's see, please answer questions about being available, ablations being available at Riverside. Am I seeing something I'm missing? Uh, what is congestive heart failure and electrical impulses involved? A congestive heart failure is when the heart does not beat, um, uh, the heart muscle is weakened sometimes. There's other reasons for it. It just doesn't process the fluid as well. It might still be strong. But the majority of the time, it's not. And the fluid can back up. And as the heart weakens um, and becomes dilated and big, it has uh, an increased risk for arrhythmias to occur. And a lot of times, it's bottom chamber rhythms that could be life-threatening. That's why they would potentially get a defibrillator. Um, and if it is um, really weak, sometimes we can put uh, a device in where we pace the right and left side and kind of mechanically make the heart beat more symmetrically together so then it's stronger and more effective at pushing the blood out and improve the heart strength or the injection fracture and improve the symptoms. So that's the where electrophysiology helps in the heart failure population. And I have one more, unfortunately. Um, what is it? Um, there is an AED in the LLS. Oh, is that telling me um, lifelong office and downstairs in the Yoda barn? So I guess y'all saw that. So that we're going there and was really excited to see that. Um, I think that's probably all the time. There was one question about ablation being available at Riverside. Um, it said, please answer the question, but I don't know. Uh, we do all ablations here AFib, A flutter, SVT, VT, PVC, all the ones I kind of outlined. We do here uh, at Riverside, and you um, come see our electrophysiologist, and they have a conversation with you to see what is appropriate treatment for you. Um, and sometimes I will say people have to have second ablations. Those AFib ablations are very complex because it's a lot of sites. Um, so you may have to have a second and even sometimes a third ablation, or sometimes you have an AFib ablation and then a flutter comes up. Um, so it's, it's, you know, we just do our due diligence with each individual person to do the best that we can and work with you. I think that's our time. Thank you for letting me come again. Y'all take care and be safe.